Welcome to our video on regression, which is really just an expansion on our lesson on correlation. Part one of this lesson, we're going to find the equation of a straight line that best fits our paired data. And then in part two, we're going to discuss uh, kind of the, the marginal change and the influential points and residual plots uh, all as uh, tools that we can use to basically analyze the strength of our correlation and our regression results. This best fitting straight line that we're going to find is what's called the regression line and the equation that describes it is our regression equation. So on to part one and the basics of regression. As stated before, our regression equation is going to express some relationship between x and y, where x is what you would call the independent variable if you were running a uh, scientific experiment, and in other cases you would normally refer to it as the explanatory or predictor variable, and then y is going to be your response variable, or again if you were running experiments you could call it the dependent. So it's kind of your input and output. We know that the typical equation of a straight line is just y equals mx plus b. Well, when we're dealing with regression equations, we just use y hat because these are now predicted y's instead of, you know, an observed y would be a y. And then instead of m and b, we use b sub 0 and b sub 1, where b0 is the y-intercept and b1 is the slope. So the same, you know, the same intercept slope idea that we get for uh, any straight line, it's just now we're giving them different uh, letter designations. Given a collection of paired sample data, the regression line or regression equation or what is sometimes called the least squares line of best fit or just line of best fit, whatever you call it, it's just simply the straight line that best fits your scatter plot of data. Now that doesn't mean that it goes through the most number of dots, right? It just means that its distance from its line to each dot is minimized you're finding a line that is as close as possible to all of the points. So that doesn't mean it has to go through the maximum number of points. It just has to have an overall closeness to all of them. And this will make more sense once we look at a picture or two. Some new notation. <clears throat> we're used to B sub 0 and B sub 1 when we're just talking about simple things, but now we're going to have these funny looking Bs. These are betas. So the regular Bs is when we're talking about our samples, right? And the betas, the Greek uh, letters, are just when we're talking about them in terms of our population. Requirements, just like before, because we're still doing correlation, right? We have to have a random sample. We should run a visual examination of our scatter plot and make sure that the points somehow fo follow a straight line pattern. Um, and then we always want to check for outliers and remove those. Very simple formulas for calculating both B1 and B sub 0 but it's easiest just to let technology do it for us. Back to the same sample of five shoe print lengths and heights that we had before. If we run through the requirements again, we know that everything's good. And then when we ran um, the examples both on our calculator and in StatCrunch, we got the following results. You can see that uh, r squared here is the same r squared here and that these two numbers a and b right is right here in StatCrunch it just writes it out as variable 2 which is our y is equal to there's my b sub 0 right, my intercept plus my b1 my slope times x variable 1. Down here is our test statistic and our p-value. Now you might get confused because you have two of them. That's because StatCrunch runs a hypothesis test on two things. It's running a hypothesis test on whether or not the intercept is equal to 0 or not and then it also runs another one on whether or not the slope is equal to 0 or not. Well remember the slope, a slope of 0 would be a horizontal line, which is what you would get when you have no correlation, right? There's no pattern to the data. So this slope of zero, that's the one that's really testing for whether or not we have a correlation. 
the intercept of zero is just testing whether or not the line goes through the origin or maybe it goes up here right or maybe it's uh, in this direction it doesn't go through the origin so it's just looking at whether or not you get um, an intercept right that your b zero is equal to zero you do test that in, in some cases but for us we're really only concerned with the slope part of it and then down here um, this is just some extra analyses that it gives you that you don't need to worry about okay here is the regression equation that we got out of all those different technologies. This tells us that if we have a shoe length of zero, right, if x equals zero, our person should be still be 125 centimeters tall, which is kind of silly, right? But I guess you could have no feet. <clears throat> From our previous lesson, we saw that our r was 0.59. If we plug all this stuff in by hand, we can see that here's our slope, our b1, right? And then here's our intercept, our b0. Same things we got using technology. And if we graph it, we get something that looks like that. I know it looks like that line goes through the origin or close to it, but look at your scale. The origin over here starts at 170, right? So this thing's been zoomed in. It starts at 25 and 170. Okay, using the regression equation for predictions, as we talked about before, the main reason why we do this junk is so that we can make predictions. We want to see if one thing somehow influences the other, and if we can find a strong relationship between those two things, then if we know one value for x, we should be able to fairly accurately predict what the value for y will be. So the whole reason why we're doing this is to be able to predict. If you remember back to our example that we did before where we talked about trying to predict how much money you will make based on various things, if we found a good correlation between years of schooling and uh, salary, then we could accurately predict how much money you're going to make based on how many years you go to school. Well, in order to do that, <clears throat> this is only going to work if the regression line on the scatter plot confirms that the regression line fits the points reasonably well. You want to find something where the points seem to fit the line. That's not a very good fit. Um, you can use the regression equation for predictions only if the linear correlation coefficient r indicates that there is a linear correlation between the two variables. And the r that we got was 0.59, which was not statistically significant. You can also only use the regression line for predictions if the data do not go much beyond the scope of the available sample. And what that means is, for instance, in this case, we only had shoe print lengths that basically ranged from about 27 to 32. You wouldn't want to try and predict heights based on shoe sizes that were much further beyond probably 25 and 35 because then you're getting too far away from your observed data and you're not really sure that the pattern that we've observed in this small data set is actually generalizable enough to go out to a much larger domain. Trying to predict far beyond the scope of the available sample data is what's called extrapolation. You're really extrapolating out beyond the data that you have. And a lot of people do this, and you know sometimes it's a necessary evil if we don't have enough data to uh, get to where we want to be, but just know that it can result in, in bad predictions. And the last thing we have to worry about is if the regression equation does not appear to be useful for making pr predictions, so if any of these previous things were, were, were bad, the, the R was too small, the dots don't seem to line up on the line, all these different types of things, then really the best predicted value we have for any y is always just going to be the average of the y's. So regardless of what the x value is, the best prediction we can make is just the average of the y's. Which is what we're restating here. <clears throat> if we cannot predict well from our regression equation, then we simply just use y bar, the average of the y values. Back to our example. If we wanted to predict the height of a person with a shoe height of 29, well, if we look at our graph, 29 is in our range, so we're not extrapolating, so that's not a problem. 
However, the line didn't seem to fit the dots very well. Our R was pretty weak. Our p-value was pretty large. So it tells us that there really isn't a linear relationship between those two things. So we really can't use it to predict. So instead of using our equation, the best thing we can do is just use the average y-value, which was 177.3. Basically what we're doing is we're saying we no longer can see any effect from shoe size. So if we're trying to predict somebody's height, it goes back to the best point estimate for the entire population of all heights is just the average of our sample of heights, which was just the average of those five people of 177.3. However, if we now use a much larger set of shoe sizes and heights, we get a much better R. We get an R of 0.813 and a p-value of basically zero. So we get a statistically significant R and we see that there is a linear correlation. And the scatter plot seems to corroborate that. We can see that the lines line up on a fairly good pattern and that the straight line goes through them fairly well. Remember, we're not trying to find a line that touches the most number of dots. We're just trying to find one that minimizes error. Using technology, we get a very simple uh, equation for our predicted y. And so now, if we want to try and predict the height of somebody with a shoe size of 29, we can see that 29 right, is, is in our model. So it's within our scope, so we're not extrapolating. Our uh, regression line seems to fit well. The scatter plot's good. We get a, a decent R value. All these things tell us that our model is a pretty good predictor, so we can go ahead and use it. We plug in 29 for x, and we get a good prediction height for a person with a shoe length of 29 centimeters is 174.3 centimeters tall. And it's just that simple, guys. That's, that's all we're doing. Now, if you remember when we did um, our example in the calculator, that if you went ahead and did the, um, the y equals part, you end up getting the regression equation right here in your y equals. Well, now you can go second table. And um, if you set up your table properly, so you have to go second window to go to table set and tell it to ask for your independent variable. Now when you go into your table, it's waiting for you to give it an x. And if I give it an x of 29, it gives me the y value from that equation. Now we can't use this one, remember, because this was the one that didn't predict well. But had we used the 40 data values that we had before, um, this would give us the right value. And in fact, if we can put that uh, equation, we can just write that equation by hand. Um, into the other one here as 80.9 plus 3.22 x. So that's going to be our other one. So now if we go back to our table, there is our second, right? That's our second uh, y2. So that's our second equation. And you can see that when x equals 29, we get that same answer of 174.3 if we round into one decimal. Okay, so it's very easy to get out of technology. If you did it in StatCrunch, all you'd want to do is um, save that equation into StatCrunch and then do the calculation that way, or just put it in your calculator and do it that way. Okay, how about beyond the basics of regression? When you're working with two variables related by this regression equation, you get a phrase called the marginal change. And the marginal change in a variable is just the amount that it changes when the other variable changes by exactly one unit. And normally when we talk about marginal change, we're talking about the marginal change in the y variable, right? the output. So in that case, the slope becomes that marginal change. Because if your slope for instance, is 3.22, every time x increases by one unit, my output is going to go up by 3.22. So that's going to be my marginal rate of change or my marginal change. Okay, 3.22 is the marginal change for this example, the slope is. In a scatter plot, an outlier is any point that is considered lying way away from the other data points. And for paired sample data, um, if you have one or more influential points, 
those are just points that aren't necessarily um, outliers, but they strongly affect the graph of the regression line. So sometimes you want to get rid of influential points even if they aren't outliers, or at least run the data both ways. Here's a nice example. On the left hand side, this one is considered an influential point. And the reason why it's an influential point is because it's all by itself. Do you see how everything else is in a cluster, right? These points all have other points around them vertically, right? So for this shoe size, there's other heights with that shoe size. This is the only person who had a shoe size of it looks like about almost 35. And because they're the only one with a shoe size of 35 and you don't have this clustering of similar shoe sizes, right, all in one band, then when your, the regression line starts to draw itself and it tries to minimize the distances between itself and every single point, well the best way to minimize the distance between itself and that point is to hit it or be really darn close to it. So that's going to be an influential point. It's going to change where this line is going to lie. When you have an outlier, that also becomes a very influential point because now when you graph it, these things all get collapsed together and you get a line with no correlation. For a pair of sample data X and Y, the residual is just the difference between the observed sample value of Y and the Y value that is predicted from your equation. Now it gets a little confusing because they're both called y, but your residual y is just equal to your observed y minus your predicted y. Here is a graph of all of those residuals. The blue line represents our equation, right, our regression equation, and the dots are the actual observed points that we have in our sample. Very small sample, right? Only four, four samples. This distance, this vertical distance between the line and the residual, sorry, the, the line and the observed line, is considered the residual. So this was a, a difference of negative 5, right? The point was 5 units below the line. This has a residual of 11, negative 13, and 7. If you take all of those numbers and square them, 25, 121, right, 169, and 49, the sum of those residuals is what this line is trying to minimize. You can visualize that if you take this line and tilt it a little up, this will get smaller and this will get smaller, but this will get bigger and this will get bigger. And when you go from 13 to 15, you go from 169 to 225, you can make a very big difference. Whereas if you go from 7 up to 6, right or from 7 up to 5 you go from 49 to 25 you don't gain right you're only losing 20 some odd but here you're gaining like 60 or 70 so you can see that a shift in one direction will make these a little bit smaller but it'll make this one drastically bigger and all the computations are doing is just figuring out which one is you know which line gives you that smallest sum total so the straight line that satisfies the least squares property is just the straight line that minimizes the sum of the squares the residuals. So again on this picture the least squares line of best fit is the line that fits those data points in such a way that these four squares have the smallest total sum of area. Right? We could obviously put a line straight through those two and they would have no area whatsoever. But then this one would be huge, right? It'd be way up here, way over there, right? We get this huge residual here and this one would also all of a sudden become a huge residual and that would be much worse than what we have here. A residual plot is just like our normal scatter plot but instead of plotting X's and Y's it plots X with the residual of the Y, right? So it, it, it plots very simply x and y minus y bar. y minus y bar is your residual. Remember it's the observed y minus the predicted y. When looking at a residual plot what you're looking for is a pattern. right? When analyzing it you're looking for a pattern in the way the points are configured and then you you compare that pattern to these two criteria. The residual plot should not have any obvious patterns. Not even a straight line pattern. 
So when we say we're looking for a pattern, you're just basically looking to see if one exists. If one exists, that's not good. If there is no pattern, then that means um, the scatter plot of the sample data is a straight line pattern. It just means it's good. The residual plot should also not become thicker or thinner when viewed from left to right. That means your residuals are getting systematically bigger or smaller. And again, that would imply that the original data um, had some pattern to it other than a straight line. Here are some examples. Um, the shoe print, the original one, the one that only had five pieces of data. If we graphed the X's with the residuals, you can see it looks like a horn, right? It's getting bigger. So it fails that second criterion of the distance is getting worse as we go. And therefore we know that uh, the standard deviations are getting worse and so it's not you know, a good predictor line which we already saw. On the following slides we're going to look at some other um, plots and see if you can uh, tell if they're good or bad. So on the first one, good or bad? Well, if you're cheating up top you know that it's good. There's no real pattern. They're just all over the place. Some are above, some are below, right? They're not getting systematically bigger. They're not getting systematically smaller. Good pattern, right? No pattern at all when I say good. And so we know the equation is a good model. Here, pretty obvious pattern to these dots. So this suggests the regression equation is not a good model. It, we probably shouldn't be doing a linear one. We should be doing something else. Here, they're getting, right, further apart as we go again telling us that the regression equa equation is not a good model. So in summary, if we're going to run regression analysis, the first thing we want to do is plot our points and look for a pattern. Right? And we want to verify that there's some sort of pattern to the lines, an approximately straight pattern. There's no outliers. If there are outliers, we want to consider getting rid of them and then comparing the results pre and post, right, before we get rid of the outliers and after we get the, uh, the outliers. Then you go ahead and you run the regression, you get your regression equation, you get your R, you get your R squared, you determine if it's a strong enough relationship and all that stuff. And then a further way of analyzing how good your analysis is, is you can construct a residual plot, which is just another scatter plot, but this time between the X's and the residuals, and you check and make sure that there's no pattern there, that you don't have any straight line pattern, non straight line pattern, just no patterns at all. It should be relatively random and you also want to make sure that they don't get thicker or thinner as you move from left to right. Further analysis could be done by using a histogram or a normal quantile plot to confirm that the values of the residuals have a distribution that is approximately normal. It's just another way of verifying that there's no pattern to them and they don't get systematically larger or smaller. You should get a nice random distribution which would give you a normal distribution and then you want to consider any effects of the pattern over time and that's that goes back to that idea of getting bigger and smaller and once you've looked at all of that that gives you the big picture to determine whether or not your regression equation is uh, is strong this is a lot of theory for the most part all you're really going to be concerned with and and caring about and working with is taking this equation and being able to predict things, right? Now that we have an equation and we have an R and R squared that tell us it's a good predictor, we can now plug in values for X and predict what Y will be. And that's regression.